But the second commentary comes from Johan Aunes Luoma, who has also solid background and base in Cold War history. As, and in combining economic and trade policies with foreign policy issues, not least in the European integration history and what else. Currently, Dr. Aunes Luma works as the research director of the Network for European Studies at the University of Helsinki. And let's hear your comments and then join for the debate. Well, thank you very much, Mikko, and I want to thank both, both presenta presentations and both speakers for, for very rich uh, talks. I'm afraid I'm going to have more answers. Uh, and uh, more questions than answers. Uh, and maybe that's the function of a commentator at this stage. Uh, when I was listening to both of the presentations, actually one big question uh, emerged that I think is, is common to both, both of these issues that we're dealing with. Are we dealing with... Uh, systemic institutional failure, or are we dealing with someone messing up with a perfectly workable system? So how deep are the structural causes of both the problems of democratization in Eastern Central Europe, and how deep are the structural causes of the current crisis in Ukraine? Or is it that we should look at the proximate causes whereby also the uh, the answers might deal with those, those more. So this is a question I have no idea. I have some intuition how it might be, but I don't know. I think in the Hungarian case, there's something I would like to call the Hungarian paradox. Hungary, unlike Ireland, seems to be always ahead of the game. If something happens in Ireland, was it 15 or 50 years later? 50. 50. Then in the Hungarian case, it's 15. During socialism, Hungary was the country that proceeded with the reforms first. The 1989 revolution in Hungary was a transition, a peaceful transition of power and handover of power because of the things that had happened there already before. Now, the question is, is Viktor Orban 15 years ahead compared to other countries in a similar situation? No, not hopefully not, but this is the, I have no <laughs> idea what the answer might be like, but this I would like to call the Hungarian paradox. Why is it? that this country appears to be the one where we see certain signs of change first in this region. Why was it so that during socialism, Hungary, 1956 happened in Hungary? Why the reforms of the 1970s and 80s did take place in Hungary, both economically and politically? And why is it the case that Hungary right now seems to be the, the country with the least reforming democracy among the 2004, 2007 countries that joined the, joined the European Union? This is my question. I don't know whether there's any any coherent answer, or it's just a coincidental. With the crisis in Ukraine, this is uh, again the same question. Are the causes in the structures of the system of a divided Europe that remained in place after the Cold War? The Cold War didn't end a division of Europe. It just moved the east-west divide further east. This is one way to look at it. And now we're dealing with with an institute, and this would be the argument saying that we are dealing with an institutional failure to, to, to manage a resurgent revisionist Russia because the system already was divided and has been divided for the last uh, 20 odd years. Or is it just something that the EU method, which refused to see Europe as divided in this geopolitical sense for the last 20 years, would that still be the answer for, for handling, handling this situation? And then I don't, I think we need to think about it, at how deep are the, the causes of the current crisis and whether they are really rooted in the, in, in the post-Cold War arrangement when, where so many Cold War structures remained in place after 1989 still. And so I would suggest that maybe we have because we need to understand, besides that we need to understand the way in, that is crucial for our understanding of the way out. And, and you provided, I think, very illuminating alternatives for, although I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't uh, choose the war option e even rhetorically, but uh, you provided us with, with some alternatives of the possible ways, ways out. Okay, if it's that we have a systemic failure, that we have somehow in the international system of Europe today, there are no real mechanisms of handling a revisionist major power like Russia. But the diplomatic institutional arrangements somehow do not, are not enough for handling, handling this situation. 
then I think we might have four alternatives how, we, how to proceed from here. A sphere, sphere of influence deal. Just acknowledge the fact on the ground. Crimea is gone, a good part of Eastern Ukraine is, is gone, Ukraine is never going to join NATO, it might have a close relationship with the European Union, and that's it. And then you just live with that arrangement. I don't think it's feasible because the European Union, Union can't handle a sphere of influence uh, deal. I don't think so, because it's inbuilt in the European Union's understanding that, it, that, it, that it's, it's not a sphere of influence. It's, it's in itself an arrangement and a project that is against, ideologically, a uh, sphere of influence. Okay, we might, there's a parallel with the US, United States, American thinking about sphere of influence and uh, whether, whether they have been acceptable or not. But this is, this is a one question. Then there would be the long game, the containment policy. Accept for a while the sphere of influence uh, tacitly and then hope to influence uh, the situation to the right direction uh, over the long term. This would be the original non-military containment policy the non-military content policy, that you would influence slowly the other side, building your own strengths, and this would be where George Kennan would come in and we would learn from his writings on how, how this, might, this might work. The third option would just be to continue the EU's traditional approach. The enlargement policies, the neighborhood policy, the spreading of its soft influence outside its external borders, <coughs> building partnerships, influencing over the, slopes, uh, over, the, over the long term. This could be a, a part of a kind of a containment approach, then hoping to influence both Russia and Ukraine in the long term, just using the mechanisms that are already in place, and just trusting the current architecture of the EU and its policy coordination and what it does economically and in the foreign and security policy field. So this would be the be calm and carry on option. The fourth option would be a bigger institutional reform in the way in which security, uh, foreign policy, economics are organized in Europe today. And then we would have to question uh, how functionable both the EU and the NATO system is. Why is OSCE apparently not enough, and why is it so weak right now? Could it be strengthened, or could we need something that would go deeper into the current institutional architecture of Europe and EU, US, Russian relations? And this would mean that we would have to go back in time to about 1989, 93, when the current architecture was more or less designed, or a bit maybe 94, 95. And we would have to revisit the decisions that were made then and see if some of those decisions could be reversed. To fit in, again, this revisionist resurgent great power Russia into the institutional arrangements of Europe. These are all uh, statements with big question marks in the end, and I would like to end with one anecdote. Uh, in Finnish schools, history is taught on all levels, primary level, secondary level. In the secondary level, we have uh, textbooks, uh, and, and it's, it's the government sets up the, the targets and the aims for the teaching and what it's taught on 20th century European international history. It doesn't say the word post-Cold War when it describes the era from 1989 onwards. It does use the word Cold War when it is the heading for post-Second World War to 1945 to 1989. Guess how it's, uh, this is from 2003, the current curricula meaning that the thinking was done in the 1990s. It says, the era of new uncertainty from 2003. Thank you.